Come, thank you. So this one, the 46 year old female, um, she was diagnosed with hepatitis C about eight years ago. She was an IV drug user and she shared paraphernalia. Um, she started approximately 10 years ago and has been clean for about five years. She does smoke. Her ultrasound showed mild fatty liver disease with hepatomegaly. Her last saga score was F0. Her exam showed enlarged thyroid. This has been an ongoing issue. We're trying to get her to endocrine, but she's not the most compliant patient. Other than that, her she has a history of depression, anxiety, ADHD, GERD, and hypertension. She's currently on albuterol, alprazolam, alderol, suboxone, wellbutrin, famotidine, gabapentin, lisinopril, and sertraline. Her Hep A and Hep B vaccinations have been ordered. She she weighs 165 pounds. Her labs were relatively okay. Her platelets were 245. Her APRI was 0.7. Child was 5A and MELD was 6. Her vitamin D was 30. She was started on a thousand unit, um, thousand I use daily. I was waiting on her hep C genotype. She is 1A. I think, I think that's it for her. I'm assuming I didn't see any interactions. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was all. Anything else needed for her? Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, we'll go right into it. Any clarifying questions from the group about this case? And everyone's welcome to chime in. Her age went by me. I'm sorry, Gary. How old is she? 46. Birth control? No. Is she, she has tubal or something or? She, according to her, she's not active at all and she doesn't want anything at this time. I think I was just curious because, you know, being on the lisinopril, there's the box warning. And then if you're thinking about treating her, yeah. My, my mind just goes in that direction. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Rexer. That was going to be my comment as well. Um, this is Kaylee. Uh, Gary, how do you think she's going to be with compliance to the hep C treatment? Does she seem a little bit more driven for that right now? She, her focus is the hepatitis C, even though I try and tell her, like, we need to address everything at once. But she lives two blocks from my office, so I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. You, you can bring her in pretty frequently. That's what I'm hoping for. But um, um, yeah, and I saw were you that you were thinking Maverick potentially, and and I had a question about the um, the famotidine with that. Yeah. And um, yeah, actually, that you don't you're good to go with, okay. with the famotidine. So that any of the acid reducing agents, it's really the um, Epcluza or Harvoni that we we worry about the drug interactions and. Um, the, the main one or one of the main ones with the Maverick that we think of with females of childbearing age would be um, estradiol, ethanol containing, uh, ethanol estradiol containing oral contra or any contraceptive. So I think that's where Dr. Rexford was going with that as well. So um, I am trying to just pull up the med list to see. I didn't, I didn't think when I looked through that there was anything else I saw that would be, um, an issue i'm just running through again i don't believe there is but um the pharmacy team can also touch on that as well but you could do maverick for eight weeks okay. and you shouldn't need any further testing you've got your fibrosis score um as long as she gets her hep a and b vaccinations at least started and signs that patient consent form uh with you then yeah you should be able to submit with the data that you have sounds good Thank you so much, Kaylee. Any other recommendations, Rachel? Go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't have any concerns from a drug interaction standpoint with what you got listed here in the Maverick, so should be good to go. Hey, it's John. Great presentation as always. I like how you get the timeline of the faction there. Um, two, two questions. Do you know what the top normal is for the AST at your 
um, lab. The, my, my eyeball test of that APRI seems too high. Give me one second. Depends on which lab they got the labs from. Right, sure does. Just trying to pull up her chart. If if I guesstimate, if the top normal is about forty, the the APRI, and it's just um remember guys that's a really it's the AST divided by the top normal for the lab, and then uh, it's a ratio with the platelet count times one hundred. So to me, that would look like it should be about. 0.5 or so. Not that it matters, but remember the 0.7, the, the higher it is, the more you worry. I do not worry about this patient having significant scar tissue. The platelets look too good. I think the uh, fibrosis markers really are confidence inspiring. Uh, I just was a tad it, interested in that. That's that's number one. Number two, her thyroid. So remember, um, if you talk big picture, what organs in the body are uh, targets of extra hepatic manifestations for hepatitis C. And um, the thyroid is a major one of them. And um, it can be hyperthyroid with uh, almost a Graves-like presentation or hypothyroid with a Hashimoto's type, both of which of course are autoimmune. And uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, um, it might be extra motivation to, to treat her uh, hep C. Maybe it'll even help that uh, goiter. That she's got going on. If it's uh, if the etiology is autoimmune. Okay. So our reference lab is fifty nine for AST. Yeah. So if I'm doing that in my head, I bet you that APRI is falsely high. Um, I, I, if I, that it'd be. I think it's okay. This is Kaylee, and I think it's okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I don't think it'll be. Yeah, I don't think it's too high on her, and just. Just to touch on that, because we're, you know, remember we're trying to um, gather as much information we can about what scar tissue could possibly present, be present, so that we know how to monitor if the patient needs monitored long term or if they're at a higher risk of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So, um, you know, if the APRI would be high, or, or even you could do a Fib4 calculation with that. But her fiber test and ultrasound weren't concerning for the. Um, uh, any kind of advanced fibrosis or really fibrosis, just that mild fatty liver. So she, she's probably somebody I wouldn't be too worried about. You need to go digging, but if you do kind of have one of those calculations that's elevated, then you may want to consider doing follow-up lab works and kind of post-treatment monitoring to see if that gets better. If it comes more in line, it's not an outlier with the other modalities you're using to assess fibrosis. Good point. Good point, John. Well, the thyroid's kind of cool. We'll see what happens. Thank you all so much. Gary, any other questions about this case that you had? No. All right, excellent. Uh, let me pull up your second case now. All right, are you able to see that okay? Yeah. Awesome. All right, I'll turn it to you again. I, this one, I think, is a little bit more straightforward. This is a 33-year-old female. She was diagnosed with hep C approximately five years ago. She was using IV drugs. She started in 2015. She's been clean for eight years. She did attend rehab and she still goes to meetings. No other drug use. She does drink socially and she smokes a pack a day. She has a history of seizures, anxiety, migraines, and vitamin D deficiency. She is on a cell, so talipram, hydroxyzine, kepra, oxycarbazine, propranolol, and vitamin D. She's also on palmina. I know that is, she is okay with switching blood, uh, birth control. She was not immune to hep A or hep B. Those were ordered. Lab-wise, Her platelets were 207, her APRI is 0.7, child is 5A, MELD is 6. She, her vitamin D was 113. She is on replacement. It was adjusted down. Her fibrosis marker was F0. I didn't do an ultrasound. 
but like I said, she's willing to switch birth control. Um, so any other concerns? Thank you so much, Gary. Any clarifying questions or comments about the case from anyone? And any feedback recommendations for Gary and this case? And I'm happy to pull up the case again, just let them know. I think if Rachel wants to talk about drug interactions, that would be awesome. I <laughs> I, I vote I vote Rachel, go ahead and go go with that because the oxcorbazepine um, does have some interactions with really all of the options. So I'm not sure if that's something that she could be uh, adjusted from or, or hold that for a while. But um, Gary, thanks for presenting her because that's she's a good a good patient that seems like she's been engaged in recovery for some time and would be a good time to address her, her hep C now. Um, and I'm glad you thought about the, the birth control switch. I actually don't even know which one Fomina is. That just tells you how far from my, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what that is made up of, or I, I'm so far off with my, my birth control options, but um, yeah, Rachel, if you want to talk about maybe the interactions or um, pathways, that would be great for any of you, the pharmacists on the call. Yeah, sure thing. So the, the problem with the ox carb is, and we've been seeing this a lot more recently, um, it is an enzyme inducer for both the cytochrome P450 enzymes that are in the, the liver, as well as some, some other like efflux pumps and things. So all that being said, really the, the risk there, and it is theoretical um, for the most part, is that it will decrease all of the DAAs because they all use one or, or both of those pathways. So that risk is that they'll be, have subtherapeutic drug levels for the, the DAAs and then risk um, uh, virologic failure essentially because they don't have significant concentrations. Um, so that's, that's the main concern. Um, I can tell you that there have been a handful of very small, at least that I'm familiar with. So if anybody else knows any chime in um, patients where there have been some centers that have done it anyways, because the patients for whatever the indication for the ox carb is, have tried at normal doses. So, you know, they've not necessarily adjusted the, the DAAs and given them double pills or, or whatever. Um, and they've had some success with those and they've shown some SBRs. But again, they're very small studies. Like I'm familiar with one study that was like five, five patients and the majority of them were on ox carb. I think like three of the five patients um, were, were on ox carb and they did achieve SVR with the, a litany of mixture of Mavericks and Harvonis and, and Epclusas. But um, I just caution that because, you know, they're, they're still currently not recommended. So from a medical legal standpoint, um, that's where you kind of run into concerns and issues is that you're going to risk the patient failing therapy because of that theoretical induction of those enzymes and those subtherapeutic levels. So, so I know some of the Medicaids can be a little bit tricky with only wanting to treat the patients once. And uh, West Virginia Medicaid for sure has a specific, you know, checkbox of are there any interactions that could risk um, sub therapeutic levels or interactions, you know, yes or no. So that's the one area where I use caution. You know, you can try um, to treat the patient and follow them. Um, there are some recommendations where you can, you know, do drug levels. That's not usually ready, readily available to monitor how much Maverick or, you know, the, the metabolites for, for um, sofosbuvir and, and those sort of things. So I don't know really that that's feasible in the real world to be able to follow that. But that's the long-winded concern is that, you know, the TLDR, you know, short version is we're risking subtherapeutic levels and failure for the patient. But I don't know if anybody else on the call has any further information on that, that, that I'm not aware of yet. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that explanation. Any other comments from the group? Gary, this is Kaylee again. I was going to just say if, if you're able to um, adjust her off of that ox carb, then I mean, really, I don't think there's any other drug interactions. So you may just kind of depending if, if she wants the shorter treatment course or not, but you could also do 
12 weeks up Clusa and then not have to adjust her um, contraception as well would be another another option. But a lot of times, you know, they'll want the shorter course. So whichever one she prefers. Um, and you'd mentioned you didn't uh, get an ultrasound on her. I don't really think that's necessary in this case. Um, I mean, I, I lost her liver enzymes, but I don't remember them being, uh, you know, significantly high, maybe just a little mildly elevated, but she really doesn't have, um, yeah, they were just, just slightly elevated. I mean, honestly, what I would suggest, I mean, you've got a fibrosis score on file. There's not any concern for cirrhosis. She's a young female. She doesn't have any real other risks for liver disease that I can tell. So um, I would only, you know, snag imaging on her if for some reason her um, transaminases were still persistently elevated after treatment, then it may be worthwhile to get imaging. But I, I think you're correct. I think that's kind of just overdoing it. If she were, you know, a 60 year old female or a, you know, 60 year old male who's had hep C for quite some time, then I think it's more important to do um, multiple modalities. But in this patient that's more straightforward and young and kind of no timeline of infection and no fibrosis at the, this point, I, I don't think you need to necessarily do both. So I agree with you. Okay. I, I mean, I'm going to reach out to her neurologist to see if we can adjust her medication. Thank you all so much for the recommendations. Any other comments from the group or Gary, any other questions? No, it's been informative. Awesome. Thank you so much for both pieces. And if you have follow-up questions, you know how to reach us. Um, and we'll make sure to have those addressed for you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, Jen, if you are ready, I am happy to share your case for you and turn things over to you. Okay, I am ready. Um, I think this is a pretty straightforward case. This is a 30-year-old uh, Caucasian male with uh, Medicaid Aetna insurance. And Mitra, if you could just go down to the HPI, his, his, his exam was, um, no, there was nothing um, beyond um, being either overweight or obese. There was nothing remarkable on his exam. But at any rate, he was diagnosed um, this year, 2022 at New River Health Center, um, routine screening. He um, had started, his history of risk factors was IV drug use starting at uh, age 19 for 11 years on and off. And he stopped doing any IV drugs uh, three years ago, continued to smoke meth until about a year ago, but um, has been really strong in his recovery since then. Um, he also has some non-professional tattoos. He was um, um, uh, vaccinated for hep B as an infant, actually, I saw him after this appointment for another appointment and his mom came to that one. She's aware of his um, hep C status and is supportive of his treatment. Um, so he was vaccinated for hepatitis B, but his, his titer, his surface antibody titer is really low. So I'm planning on giving him another shot of that. He had no um, symptoms. Uh, when I saw him, he's unemployed. He's a day laborer. He injured his leg. He's been unemployed since then. Um, he is single and is monogamous with a female partner. Um, his only other comorbidity is that he is a smoker. Um, he does have vitamin D deficiency and is on replacement. He is not immune to Hep A, um, and we are going to start his vaccination series and then also give him a, um, I guess you'd call it a booster on his Hep B, and I'll probably repeat his service antibody after that. He um, is has a BMI of 33.6, so he's technically obese. And then you could go to the labs. I don't think there was anything remarkable on the labs. You can see there that is CBC, including platelets were normal. <clears throat> oh, his, yeah, his, uh, his ALT was elevated. Um, uh, and everything else looked good. His APRI was 0 0.52, child took her Q class A, his MELD I think was six, you could scroll down. Um, he did, um, there is iron studies, uh, vitamin D, AFP 1.9. 
He is, does not have HIV infection. His genotype is 1A, 355,000 says viral load. And his serum fibrosis marker was F0. He did have an ultrasound that showed um, just minimal hepatic steatosis. Um, and so uh, I would plan to treat him with either Maverick or Abclusa. And I don't really have any other questions about him. Thank you so much, Jen. As always, you do a wonderful job presenting and we appreciate you. Um, any mm -hmm. clarifying questions from the group about this case? So feel free to chat in or unmute. Jennifer, do you have the uh, Heplosast to try for your hepatitis B no, revaccination? No, what is that? Oh, the uh, it's the new conjugate um, hepatitis B vaccination that's more immunogenic oh. than the traditional hepatitis B vaccine. Uh, and it's only two of them. I'll have to find out. I don't think we do. Hep Heplotas? Heplosav. Heplosav. It's expensive. Mm. That's the only thing. But I believe Medicaid covers it. Okay. But we just got it at our clinic here at WVU within the last couple months. So, I mean, I can put you in contact with the Heplosav um, rep to kind of help get it on your formulary or help get it in stock if you'd like. Sure, send me an email. That'd be awesome. Yeah, we, we just recently were able to finally get it on our, our formulary. But um, yeah, it's only two doses and a month apart. Oh, nice. So, uh, thanks, John. You could do either treatment option, whatever you choose, whatever he wants to do. <laughs> if he doesn't mind taking it with food, just Maverick for eight or Eclusa for 12. Um, you could even do Harvoni. I know it's not on, in, on formulary anymore, but Harvoni for eight weeks would be another option for him if, if it were um, on formulary for him since his viral load is, is pretty low and doesn't have cirrhosis or HIV. And um, uh, I wanted to, to kind of backtrack with when I was talking to with Gary about, you know, you don't have to necessarily get an ultrasound. We do want to generally get ultrasounds on, you know, all of our patients too. So we're getting that liver imaging. Um, I guess I should have rephrased my comment to say that it shouldn't necessarily um, hold up the hep C treatment process. So if, if everything else looks okay, then you can go ahead and start the process. And then it like, if their ultrasound isn't scheduled for a few more months or something, or they have transportation issues, we shouldn't withhold treatment just while we're waiting on that exam. If everything else points to no, no fibrosis. And um, in his case, he's got some minimal steatosis and ALT elevation. So again, you know, he's, he's obese. And so trying to lose weight and treat his hep and kind of talk about those risk factors, but I would, you know, consider doing follow-up imaging on him probably in a year or so, only if his um, ALT still remains elevated post-treatment, okay. um, because he's already got that established steatosis, which could independently also progress to fibrosis as well. Um, and I guess the only other comment I was going to make was just more like a general poll with the providers that are on the line. When you have a patient that's coming into care for you, um, do you guys try to go ahead and give them a dose of hep A and B vaccine while they're there? Or do you wait to get your um, labs back? Kind of what's the, I, I just was interested to know what everybody's practice is. Cause I think when I see people, I'm not sure if they're gonna come back. So I just try to get a dose in them if possible, but I wasn't sure if that's how, um, if that's feasible in private practice is probably my, my better way to phrase that. So I can answer because I'm unmuted. Um, but but I so I've started doing that because um, and so two factors have um, um, two things have been a factor for me. One is I've been seeing a lot of people by telehealth and then finding that they weren't coming back in either for their labs or their vaccines. So I've started having people come in for their initial visit and giving them their first dose. This guy had tended to, and then we forgot and. Um, and so anyway, but he'll, he'll come back. I'm glad you're doing telehealth. That's reaching a lot more people. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And I work at one, you know, I work at our Nicholas County site, which is far away from a lot of people. So it was beneficial for a lot of people, but then I 
I really struggle to get people to follow up after that. So I, it's kind of a balancing act. Um, uh, even people who are really motivated to get treatment, some of them I still haven't gotten labs on. And um, so I'm, I'm stepping back to in-person visits for a while to see if that's, um, it certainly expedites their care because I get all the lab work when they're here and can present more quickly. Um, anyway, we'll see. Thanks, Jen. Thank you all so much. Any other comments, feedback about this case? And Jen, any other questions you had about this case? Um, no, we have a didactic today, right? Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah, I don't have any other questions. So the question sure? I have is so shoot. Yeah, the question I have is sort of um, a side topic. I can, <laughs> save, it. I can save it for another day. That's yeah, okay. Okay, you can shoot us an email. We're always happy to have it addressed via email as well. Maybe we, if we have time at another session, I can uh, ask the question. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, absolutely. We never want to you know, uh, skip over any questions that anyone has. So you are, are always welcome to email us. Um, before we hop into our didactic portion, we have been getting a lot of questions from different participants about, I guess, echo case guidelines and what qualifies as an echo case now and what complex cases entail. So uh, Elizabeth and I are clinicians, so we don't necessarily know really like the down to the details of all those things. So if anyone had questions about that, again, you can email us about it. Next uh, session, we're actually dedicating, um, instead of having a didactic, just having sort of an open discussion. So that might be a good session for you all to sort of brainstorm questions you have um, moving forward about echo cases. So um, just keep that on your radar um, and we'll uh, field any questions that come through in the meantime until then. So I just wanted to throw that out there before the uh, end of the announcements at the end of the session. So uh, without further ado, Samantha, I'll turn things over to you for the didactic. We're so, so excited to have you here. Um, I'm happy to share screen and advance your slides for you. Just let me know uh, when you'd like me to go to the next slide. So I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everyone. As I said, my name is Samantha. I'm a pharmacy resident at the specialty pharmacy. So today we're going to kind of be doing a very general um, drug interactions review with the hepatitis C treatments. You can go ahead, Nitra. So I obviously won't read through the objectives, but kind of big picture takeaways that I hope you guys get from today is essentially, you know, keeping the importance of these things in mind, kind of having these key medication classes slash uh, categories in your back pocket so that as you're going through patients med lists, you can quickly identify some of those big ones um, and then kind of knowing what to do with them if they occur. So importance of evaluating these interactions. Of course, we know the importance is reducing patient harm. We wanna make sure that they're receiving the best treatment option that we can give them, um, making sure they're not experiencing adverse effects, but really to kind of put it into numbers, an estimated 30 to 60% of patients started on DAAs are at risk for a clinically significant drug interaction. So that's kind of the importance in knowing that a lot of our patients potentially could have some of these things that we should be looking for. Um, I found one study that specifically looked at the pangenotypic regimen. So I'll be going over um, Epluza, Maverit, Harvoni, and Zepatir. But this study looked at Maverit and Epluza and showed that 41% of patients who were um, starting on Maverit had a potential drug-drug interaction and 27% with Epluza. And so to call out those different levels that are on there just um, for completeness sake, level one is like a weak potential interaction. Level two is just a potential interaction. And then level three is contraindicated. And so it would make sense to see more contraindications with Maverit. We know it has that HCV protease inhibitor in it. Um, so it's good that th that number is lower, but it's still there. Um, and so those numbers do kind of fall into that 30 to 60%. And so kind of putting it into place to understand the importance. Go ahead, Mitra, thank you. Um, so kind of where to begin whenever we're looking at 
drug-drug interactions. I'm sure that you have all looked at these before, um, probably have it saved um, to look at, but just to put it here, um, of course, guidelines. So the guidelines have a really nice chart that kind of gives you the basic understanding where the guidelines fall a little bit short is it doesn't explain them in detail a lot. So that's where really the interaction checkers and package inserts would come into play. Um, University of Liverpool is a go-to that's called out in the guidelines as a preferred interaction checker. And then the package inserts also give some more specific dosing guidance for some of these that we'll talk about. Um, what I do kind of recommend though is looking at more than one resource. And so you might see some contradictory information on one or two of them. And that's really where clinical judgment will come into play. But if you kind of give yourself the, the most information to make that clinical judgment, that'll be really beneficial when looking at these. So I've kind of pulled these six classes, amiodarone and is in and of itself, but that we wanna talk about, cause these are kind of the most common, the ones that we see a lot. Um, there's definitely more, so this is not all inclusive, but these are the ones that I think are the most important for us to touch on. So first we'll talk about the psychiatric agents. Um, this is a big one because, you know, with the patient population, we always have the potential to see some of these, whether it's, you know, for depression, anxiety, any of the above. Um, but what I wanted to call out is that there's really only one contraindication and that's Pimazide with Maverick, Harvoni, and Zepatir. And Pimazide is a first generation antipsychotic that's used for Tourette's essentially. And so the reason why I call that out is that that's the only contraindication. So while Mavra, Epluza, Harvoni, and Zepatir do mention additional monitoring with aripiprazole, ketiapine, paliperidone, clozapine, it doesn't preclude use. And so essentially what we're getting at here is that there's no clinically significant interactions with any of these. Um, just for completeness sake, I included some of the common agents that don't have clinically significant interactions there. So our SSRIs, SNRIs, benzos, TCAs, um, et cetera. So just pulling from that, knowing that there may be some additional monitoring for side effects, because what, what this interaction is, is just the potential to increase the concentration of the psychiatric agent. And so if that happens, we could see some, some side effects, but nothing that would potentially be clinically significant. So then getting into anticonvulsants, which, you know, we kind of already had this discussion. Rachel did a really good job at explaining this. Um, so the agents there are not recommended due to that decreased concentration of hep C therapy. Naturally, you know, as she's already mentioned, if we're decreasing those concentrations, decreased likelihood that our, that our patients are going to achieve SVR12, which then could be an issue moving forward with additional treatment. And, you know, we don't really want to give a patient a drug that potentially is not going to do anything for them. So really with this one, this is probably maybe the most difficult one to deal with because you know providers and patients both kind of have to be consulted because we're dealing with anticonvulsants, you know, that's a risk benefit type of thing where if the patient is controlled, the provider, you know, may or may not want to attempt to switch them. We also need to keep in mind that these medications, some of them can be all used for bipolar. And so that might have an effect on what we're switching to and, and those type of things. So also keep that in mind when you're looking at the interaction checkers, because the recommended alternatives may or may not be appropriate for the indication for the patient. And so I include in there, you know, some of the common ones that do not have a clinically significant interaction if, if changes are anticipated. So then acid reducing agents, another big one that we kind of dived into a little bit, but we'll get into some more specifics. So mechanism behind this one, of course, you know, we're taking these medications on purpose to reduce the acid in our stomach, but in doing that, we're increasing the pH. Um, so then the absorption of some of these hepatitis C meds would decrease. And so to handle these, you know, ideally we would want them to hold these medications if they can, but in patients who have GERD or are just unable to stop these medications, we can either choose an alternative hep C regimen or we can choose an alternative um, acid reducing regimen. And there are some specific dosing things that we'll go through. So with the antacids, um, these, the recommendation with Epluz and Harvoni 
calling out just kind of like Kaylee said, Maverick and Zepatier are good with any of the acid reducing agents. So I kept it there for completeness sake, just to follow along with, but really up clues and harmony are the ones that we'll need to worry about. So this recommendation is generally for most medications with the acid, with antacid. So we would just wanna make sure that if a patient has to use these still, that they're separating the administration by four hours. The next one being um, H2RAs. So really right now that's just famotidine. Um, that one, if, they're, if they need to take it, we need to administer it at the same time as the Epcluz and Harvoni or separate it by 12 hours. And it also does have a max dose. So equivalent to 40 milligrams twice daily of famotidine. Um, I'm not mentioning ranitidine, you know, it was recalled. We're not really seeing that in patients anymore. And same kind of thing with cimetidine. So that's another H2RA that generally is not used because in and of itself, it has a lot of drug interactions. And the big one um, are proton pump inhibitors, PPIs. So Epcluz and Harvoni now kind of have their own separate recommendations for these, whereas before they fell into place with each other. So with Epcluza, Technically not recommended. However, you know, if they do have to administer a Plusa and a PPI, the Plusa would have to be taken with food four hours before omeprazole 20 milligrams. And it is omeprazole 20 milligrams only because no other PPIs have been studied. The difference with Harvoni is that they can do doses comparable to omeprazole 20 milligrams or lower, and that's administered at the same time on an empty stomach. And so the PPIs are the ones that likely may still need to look into whenever you come across these, um, if a patient needs to be adjusted. And then I included some of the comparable doses to the side. So a lot of patients are taking pantoprazole 40. Um, that's comparable to omeprazole, so that would be fine. And then statins. Um, this is another one where the ideal situation is just to hold their statin during therapy. Um, this would be a conversation with the provider where, you know, if a patient was at severely high risk and needed to stay on their statin, there are recommendations for the dosing. Um, this essentially is because the statin concentrations are increased, which we could see toxicity, um, looking specifically for like hepatic toxicity, um, muscle aches, the, the big things with statins, worst case scenario, maybe rhabdo. Um, so Obviously, we can see the recommendations here. The two to kind of call out would be the do not administer with Harvoni and Maverick. Same kind of concepts that I mentioned earlier. You know, those are the ones that have the protease inhibitor in them. We would expect to see more contraindicated um, do not administer interactions. Those have more interactions with those things in general. Um, and then another one is this use lowest necessary dose. And so really big question mark and what does that mean? Because the lowest necessary dose for one patient is gonna be different than another. And that's, I, I kept it there because that's technically what's in the package insert and in the guidelines, but really we should interpret that as monitor. So we shouldn't pull it and say, oh, we need to lower the patient's dose. Um, you would still just treat it like that big chunk in the middle monitor them, make sure you know we're not seeing any drastic increase in their hepatic enzymes, make sure they're not experiencing any toxicity from, from the statin and, and going from there. And then of course, you know, Crestor and Pravastatin and Atorvastatin, those kind of have some max doses or, or specific dosing things if it would be necessary for you to look into for those patients. Ethanyl estradiol products, we did just touch on that a little bit too. So Maverick is the only one that we really are concerned about because it's contraindicated specifically with ethanyl estradiol. So we don't know the true mechanism, but in studies in women who are taking um, oral contraceptives that contain ethanyl estradiol with Maverick, they had increased ALT levels. So we just baseline, you know, contraindicated recommendations, of course, choosing one of the other options for hep C that do not have an interaction. We could, of course, you know, if the patient is adamant that they want Maverick because of the lower duration, we could change their um, ethanol estradiol product. And so if it's for contraceptive purposes, of course, we have progestin only options or non-hormonal options as well. And then if it's for hormone replacement therapy, making sure to realize that it's just ethanyl estradiol. So conjugated estrogens would be okay um, if you 
look into the product and it doesn't specifically say ethanol estradiol, then that would be okay. And then amiodarone is kind of in and of itself, but a big one, again, because co-administration with amiodarone can cause serious symptomatic bradycardia and heart block, which has led to fatalities in some cases. So with Harvoni and Upcluza, it's contraindicated. Maver and Zepatir, eh, not technically contraindicated, but the potential interaction is still there um, and should definitely be monitored. So that's what the package inserts will say too, is that if we have to co-administer amiodarone with any of these, you know, cardiac monitoring would be required. And kind of also thinking clinically about the amiodarone is that this might not necessarily be something that would be worth switching a patient if they're already on it, because we know the half-life of amiodarone is it varies, but something like 60 days. And so if we know that by the time that they're finishing their treatment, it wouldn't have mattered if we stopped the amiodarone anyway. So really eyeballing this before we start treatment in patients, if they are already on it and we're thinking about starting amiodarone, then maybe that's when you would say, mm, but otherwise cardiac monitoring would just be required for these patients. So then additional considerations that didn't fit nicely into the, you know, the last sections or just kind of big picture things to look at. We'll look at um, medications for diabetes, MAT, patients with co-infection, um, the bleeding risk with antiplatelets and anticoagulants, and then herbal supplements. Did it freeze on you, Mitra? <laughs> it did do something weird where it backtracked. There we go. Is this the right slide? Um, no, we'll move forward to medications for diabetes. I think it's still going backwards. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. There we go. <laughs> Next one. Okay, perfect. Um, so medications for diabetes is not really a drug interaction, but just kind of something to keep in mind, again, being able to identify when we're looking at these patients, because changes in hepatic function due to us treating their hepatitis C can alter their blood glucose control and then potentially lead to serious hypoglycemia. But again, this kind of requires you to identify patients and look into their current glucose control. So maybe if a patient is very well controlled on their medications, you know, those are the ones where you might say, mm, well, if we lower it anymore, are we going to risk that hypoglycemia? If you have a patient who unfortunately is not very well controlled, you know, maybe when their blood glucose drops a little bit, it's not going to be that big of a deal. We do have to remember though, if a patient is used to sitting at a certain glucose level, their hypoglycemia might appear, you know, earlier than someone is used to being in that range. So just kind of very patient specific, but it could be something to counsel the patient on either signs to look for hypoglycemia, what to do if they experience it. And if they are experiencing it during treatment, that could potentially require some dose adjustments or discontinuation of medications. Specifically, we're thinking of the ones that already kind of put them at risk for hypoglycemia. So maybe insulin, sulfonylureas, those type of things. So then medication assisted treatment. Um, the big key takeaway here, I included it, is that suboxone, methadone, and naltrexone are okay to be administered and there's no expected drug interactions. Um, this is also mentioned in the package inserts as being okay with the four um, therapies that we're talking about. So if you see that, no concern. Patients with hep C and HIV co-infection get very tricky and complex, and so that could be a presentation in and of itself. So really, I just wanted to call out, this is the chart that's in the guidelines. It looks very overwhelming, would never expect anyone to straight up memorize a lot of these things. So key takeaway is that if you see a patient who is co-infected, um, making sure that you're always, always, always performing interaction checks and looking in to make sure that we're not affecting their treatment for either one of those infections. Bleeding risk is another one that we kind of see with a lot of um, treatments just in general. So um, agents that should be monitored due to an increased risk of bleeding with all of the hep C therapies would be your typical warfarin and then apixaban, rivaroxaban, ticagrelor. 
There's only one agent though that's contraindicated and that is with Maverick. So that might be the easier way to kind of think of this is dabigatran with Maverick is contraindicated. Um, if we're going to talk about, you know, monitoring for patients, cause really that's a majority of what we'll be doing, of course, making sure they're checking their INRs, we're following up on those. Um, and then with the other ones that don't usually require monitoring, you know, telling patients what to look out for, for signs of bleeding. Herbal supplements is another one. Um, St. John's war is contraindicated with hep C treatment um, due to decreased therapeutic effects. So kind of very similar, but I called out that one because it's mentioned in the guidelines and the, um, the package inserts. So there's of course many other things that we would wanna be concerned about with herbal supplements. That's not to say that they don't have benefit in some situations, um, but we just have to be mindful. So the ones you know that we know of that are don't have any issues would be like melatonin, multivitamins, those type of things. However, um, reminding patients, especially, you know, to tell us if they start anything that they bought over the counter or through whatever mechanism they could buy stuff through because they're not regulated the same way that prescription med medications are. We can't guarantee their safety, their concentration, potency, et cetera. So um, just kind of telling patients that so that they know to check in if they start anything. Um, recommendation here is really to refer to the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. There's other resources out there as well, just to kind of make sure that we're not um, decreasing any effectiveness. So in summary, big picture here, um, of course, what do we need to do? So always obtaining accurate medication lists to the best of our ability. You know, sometimes you might have to probe patients. So I liked that some of you guys were saying, oh, she's of childbearing age. You might have to ask them specifically, you know, are you taking any birth control? Um, again, with some of the other things, especially over-the-counter products, you might have to come up with a couple specific examples to ask them if they're taking those things because a lot of the times they just don't think it's important if they don't pick it up from their pharmacy. So keeping those things in mind, keeping the big interactions that we know of to maybe probe for questions, to look for specific things, um, identifying the key interacting medications. So specifically the, the ones that we covered today, being able to just pull those from a med list and say, oh, I think I know that that's an interaction. Um, knowing kind of you know, where to go and what to do when you see those things. And then of course, utilizing that information that you're finding to select appropriate therapy or make whatever recommendations you need to make. The why we we know the importance, but of course, you know, we want to prevent unnecessary adverse effects. We want patients to complete therapy. And so if they're experiencing any of these adverse effects, the likelihood of them completing drops significantly. Same thing, you know, with reducing patient harm and per prescribing and dispensing errors. So the better off we are at the beginning to avoid some of these things, the, the better outcomes for our patients, which goes to the last bullet of, you know, we have an increased likelihood then of therapy completion and cure, which is our ultimate goal. So those are just my references. Um, and then I'll take any questions that you guys might have. Thank you so, so much, Samantha. You did a wonderful job presenting and I appreciate you uh, being patient with my tech issue. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. Absolutely. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the group? Samantha, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that review. It's it's always a good, it doesn't matter how long we've been doing this, it's always a good refresher to go through those again. So I, I thank you very much. Thanks, Kaylee. We got a couple of chats in as well, thanking you and saying it was a great presentation. Any comments or questions? No pressure. <laughs> and I will be attaching your slides in the recap email as well, Samantha, so everyone will have a copy of those wonderful slides and resources. I guess I have maybe one question. Sure. You had mentioned about possibly using more than one um, kind of interaction checker kind of things. Do you find that any of them are biased one way or another? Or what, what would be the reason for that? No, I think really a lot of it comes down to just clinically looking at like pharmacokinetics. So I feel like a lot of the interaction checkers will say, 
assuming because we know that this medication either induces or inhibits a CYP enzyme, then it's coming up with a potential interaction for that. Whereas some of them don't look at the potential for pharm pharmacokinetic things. So they leave out that potential interaction. And so some of them are better in, in terms of, we don't necessarily have data to show that this is an interaction, but we can infer based on other interactions that we know that that could be a potential. And so I know, you know, if you look at the package inserts, they won't explicitly list every single thing. But if you check on like the Liverpool drug interactions, they make a lot of inferences based on those things so that you can really use your clinical judgment to say, okay, that makes sense now that I've seen it in words. And they'll say, does not recommend based on X, Y, and Z. So it's not necessarily a bias, but I just think some of them kind of use more of a an intelligence factor or something like that to say like, this is a potential and this is why. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Dr. Exford. Any other questions, comments? We do have about five minutes left. So Jen, if you have that question you wanted to ask, I'm glad we do have some time at the end here too. I feel like I'm sort of cheating because I could have looked it up. Um, it's a question about, and I didn't, <laughs> it's a question about acute HIV infection. Um, and it's because my, um, the patient that I presented came in, he tested negative for HIV and he is uh, in a monogamous relationship. Um, he, he, but he came in the following week or 10 days after I saw him with, um, you know, a sore throat, lymphadenopathy, myalgias, um, some other upper respiratory symptoms. And he, um, he tested negative for COVID and flu and strep. I actually ended up treating him after about Four, he also tested negative for mono. I ended up treating him after about four days um, with an antibiotic just because fever, persistent fever and lymphadenopathy. Um, but, it, you know, he was, he was a guy with hep C. He, he says he hasn't used IV in um, three years. And I, so anyway, I it crossed acute HIV infection crossed my mind. I've never seen acute HIV, never had a patient with HIV in my practice that I knew of. So anyway, um, I'm not, so I guess my questions would be two. One is what is the pr presentation, if I recall that it's, there can be just a viral syndrome type presentation. And two is, um, if you just had a negative test, I wouldn't think you would retest um, if he, if there's no active risk factor. That was my question. How, how, um, Jen, this is Kaylee, how soon, or, or uh, kind of give me timeline of when he just had a negative Did test. A negative, he had a negative test uh, two weeks prior. Two weeks prior to the development of the symptoms. Do right. you know what it what the test was? Was it the combined antigen antibody screen, or was it an, an anti antibody test or a rapid test? What kind of? It, it was an antibody test. Okay. Okay. I would retest him. Okay. I would. Um, and with, actually, with an antigen test. If you have that available, yes, I would say if you do have an antigen, uh, you know, a combined antigen antibody test, then. Okay. Um, how long ago did you see him? You said he's had 10 days, 10 was, plus days of these symptoms now. It was just a week ago that I saw him and he had had about, when I treated him, he had had about five days of symptoms. Okay. So, I mean, if you, if you do now, if you did a repeat antibody test, that may still be negative, but I, I commend you for keeping that on the differential because that certainly could be a possibility. I mean, he, I, I know he's not saying he has risk factors, but it's also something that you don't want to miss right. uh, if, if, you know, there, there has been some exposure, but if you can do a, a, a antigen, combine antigen antibody screen, um, the antigen would turn up sooner than just the antibody test. But right. with that timeline, I mean, in most cases, it's going to be positive within the, you know, after 10 days, it'll be out of that window period by now. Okay. Um, if that's not feasible, then I honestly would say instead of 
doing an, anti, uh, an HIV antibody, if you can't get the antigen um, combined test, then I would go ahead and just order an HIV viral load on him. Okay, gotcha. And are you saying the, an the antigen test has to be within 10 days? No, actually, so there's that window period from the exposure and before they actually seroconvert at all. So there is the time frame from after there's an exposure and sometimes even if they've developed symptoms to, you know, quickly that their antigen tests would even still be negative. Okay. Usually, um, usually after 10 days, um, you're gonna already have a, a positive antigen. So they say 10 to 14 days should expect that antigen to be positive. Okay, great. That's really helpful. Thank you. The antibody can take a few months even. So um, yeah, so it just depends on what, what testing you're doing. But if you have any reservations or, or anything at all about not um, being able to get that combined antigen test, then I would go ahead and just order the viral load. Yeah, great. That's super helpful. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for the feedback and that question, Jen. Any final comments? We are at the end of the session, but if there are any questions, you can feel free to unmute or chat in still. All right, well, big shout out to Gary and Jen for the case and Samantha, thank you so much for the didactic as well. We really appreciate you all um, and all of the recommendations and feedback. Uh, only announcement I have is that the next session will be on September 8th. And as I briefly mentioned before, we'll be having an open discussion um, about the guidelines for what entails a complex case for an echo consult and case presentation. So uh, keep in mind any questions you have, bring it to next session. Um, and we'll be going over any cases at that session as well as usual. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks, everyone. Bye.